Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, to the week's three and four webinars. We'll be getting started in just about two minutes. Okay, it's 201. Just some logistics um, before we get started here with the webinar. Um, everyone is muted and we would like to do questions on a discussion document, which I will drop into the chat in just a moment. So you can um, ask any questions on that discussion document um, directly to the speakers and they can um, answer back and you can discuss things more um, in depth that way. Um, and at the end, we can, we can also use some in the chat box if we have time, but please try to use the discussion document. And that will be linked into the window in just a moment. And everyone is muted. Um, the first speaker today is a 15 minute talk by Doug Miller and it is um, titled, Skillful Subseasonal Prediction of the United States Extreme Warm Days and Standardized Precipitation in, in Memorial Summer. Uh, do I have access to the screen? I'm not. There we go. All right. Okay. Okay. I thank you um, all so much for um, allowing me to. Um, are you able to see the screen change? It's not shown on mine. No, but it's not. We're seeing your PowerPoint uh, here. It's not in presenter mode, but we're seeing your whole PowerPoint app. Okay, let me uh, just cast my whole. Okay, how about now? Yep, looks great. Okay, great. Okay, first off, I'd like to start off by um, thanking um, everyone for allowing me to speak during this session. Um, as the, was said, uh, my name is Douglas Miller. Um, I recently defended my PhD in mid-December. I'm kind of in this uh, limbo period. I'm about to start my postdoc um, at Northern Illinois in Argonne with Victor Gensini. Um, but this is one of our uh, last studies for my PhD um, where I worked with my advisor, Zhou Wang, at the department. Um, of atmospheric sciences at the University of Illinois. Uh, we also did this along with Bo Lee, who is um, a part of the Department of Statistics at the University of Illinois, Dan Harnos from the Climate Prediction Center, and then Trent Ford, uh, who's at the Illinois State Water Survey, also at the University of Illinois. Um, and this work is um, kind of under, uh, is under review right now uh, with the Journal of Climate. Um, and this is titled, Skillful Subseasonal Prediction of United States Extreme Warm Days, and standardized precipitation index in boreal summer. So we need to start off um, with a, a motivation on why we want to look at this extended range extreme warm days. Um, well, this is a, a figure here um, showing the weather fatalities um, from 2019 uh, put out by the NOAA Natural Hazard Statistics. And if we focus in on uh, the fatalities due to extreme heat and the 10-year average 
Uh, we can see that on, on average for the past 10 years, over 100 fatalities have occurred due to extreme heat. And we also have a large uh, value of property and crop damage. So the 10-year average of $3 million per year um, of property and crop damage due to extreme warm temperatures. So uh, we know that these extreme temperatures are a large producer of fatalities um, and, and other damages. So of course, having a skillful prediction on the you know, week three and four time scale would help to mitigate some of these losses. Um, you know, and, and hopefully decrease these values. So it's important to kind of know where we're at right now, right, with our, our operational models in predicting extreme values on the weekly time scale. This uh, figure here shows the 14-day and 7-day um, predictions of extreme warm days. And this was a paper uh, by Tian et al. in 2017, where they evaluated the climate forecast system version 2 in predicting these values. If we focus in on the seven day predictions here, so looking at week three and week four, um, each of these different bars represents a different region of the United States in predicting extreme warm days. And if we focus in on the, the dark red here, um, this is our the average high key skill score over the United States. We can see that the average high key skill score is, you know, maybe between 10 and 15 at weeks three and four, which is uh, hardly more skillful than climatology. Um, you know, knowing that a, a positive high key skill score is better than climatology. Um, it's, you know, it's still greater than climatology, but it's something that's, it's less, um, less skillful than our statistical model uh, can predict, which I'll show uh, in the next coming slides. Uh, we use two predictors during this study. Uh, one is soil moisture, and then the other is going to be the Pacific SST. We can use the soil moisture because there's a well-known inverse relationship between soil moisture um, and extreme temperature. This figure here from Huang et al. 1990, uh, 1996 shows the correlation between May soil moisture and then the following July temperature. Um, and this correlation is calculated between 1931 and 1993. And basically what we see is, uh, you know, significant negative correlations across the United States, uh, which indicates when we have dry soil moisture conditions during the month of May, we're going to see an increase in temperature or extreme temperatures um, in the following July. So there's, there's, there's this lag relationship between soil moisture and temperature making it a valuable predictor. Uh, as I stated, the second one we're really interested in using in this study is Pacific SST. And we use this because previous studies have shown that mid-latitude North Pacific SST anomalies Proceed United States heat wave events. Uh, this is a figure from taken from McKinnon et al. 2016, uh, where this is a composite of 50 days before um, extreme heat events in the eastern United States. And what they really show in the paper is that we have this anomalous SST pattern um, that persists throughout this 50 day period uh, preceding these heat wave events over the eastern half of the United States. So, due to this, you know these studies showing these persistent anomalous SST patterns. Um, that's why we really wanted to use a Pacific SST index. So our goal for this study is to utilize a North Pacific SST index and soil moisture to predict July extreme warm days per week and a 14-day standardized precipitation index at weeks three and four using a multiple linear regression model. So very quickly, um, just stating the data that we use, um, all the observational analysis in this study is using the uh, data from the ERA interim reanalysis um, over the time period 1979 to, um, I believe 2017 is the time period we used, uh, but it is available um, until 2019. Uh, and then to compare the, the forecast skill of our statistical model, uh, we wanted to compare it to an operational model uh, so it, what we do is uh, use the reforecast produced from the NCEP uh, CFS version 2, uh, which has four ensemble members over the uh, time period 1999 to 2010. Um, how we uh, define extreme warm days are, um, an extreme warm day is going to be a day with the detrended daily average temperature greater than the 90th percentile of all July days at each grid point. And then of course, during a weekly period, we're just gonna count these, this number of extreme warm days up. Um, as stated you know, in the title um, and the goal, uh, we, we wanted to examine how well we can predict some aspect of precipitation. Um, so what we do here is use a 14 day standard precipitation index, which 
uh, uses the the 14 day accumulated precipitation within a 10 by 10 degree box at each grid point. And this is going to help um, remove some of the, the zero uh, precipitation days and make it an easier transformation um, for the SPI. And if you're not familiar with what the SPI is, um, it's a widely used index for meteorological drought. And how you calculate it is fit a gamma function to an accumulated precipitation distribution where here we use the 14 day um, and then you transform this to a normal distribution. And basically SPI is the number of standard deviations away from some normal um, or some average value. Um, so any SPI that's positive is going to be wet conditions and SPI with negative values are going to be dry conditions. Um, so here I'm showing the two predictors that we use for our multiple linear regression model. Um, on the left, I have the second leading EOF mode of the Pacific SST. And what we can see, there's these kind of two patterns that pop out or two centers of action that pop out in the Northern Pacific. Uh, one here I have labeled B and A. And simply what our, our, NP, uh, the, our SST index is, is the boxed average of B minus the boxed average of A. Our second uh, predictor for this study um, is the uh, principal component associated with the second leading EOF of um, uh, US soil moisture. Um, and the EOF mode uh, shows this, say, drier soil moisture conditions um, over the eastern half of the United States, uh, where we, and then where we have, um, say, more moist soil moisture conditions over the, the southern plains and central plains of the United States. So we're using that, that principal component time series associated with this pattern here. So I'd first off to like, I first off would like to show you why these predictors um, are able to be used in skillful predictions in a statistical model. And how I do this is, is first to composite several variables three to four weeks in the future after our SST index is less than the 10th percentile. So again, we're looking three to four weeks in the future after our index um, experiences an extreme value. So looking at three and four weeks in the future, after this extremely negative SST index value, what we can see shown by the contours is this a significant wave train pattern that stretches from the Western Pacific across the Pacific and has an anti-cyclone um, develop over the Eastern half of the United States. This uh, further strengths into the week four and we actually have some retrogressing patterns um, at this uh, week four period. Now associated with this anti-cyclone here, uh, we see a in significant increase in, an or in a, a blocking frequency, uh, which is shown by the white contours here. And then with this dynamical mechanisms of atmospheric blocking, uh, we see a significant increase in extreme warm days per week, shown by the red shading here. And then also we see negative values uh, in the 14-day the SPI at weeks three and four, shown by the dashed contours, which would, um, again, indicate dry conditions. So again, Three to four weeks in the future, we're seeing this wave train that produces um, an increase in extreme warm day values over the eastern half of the United States. One of the really interesting parts about this paper is uh, we, we found that the North Pacific SST index is related to the circumglobal teleconnection pattern. And specifically what we found is that it's only these persistent CGT events that have impacts on the SST and extremes over the eastern United States. So how I, I show this here is I first correlate the SST index and Z500 at week zero at each grid point. And what we see is, uh, you know, some significant centers of action pop up in this plot. I then create an index based off some of these centers of action. And then we're interested in seeing when this uh, CGT index is extreme for more than five days within week zero. So this left figure here on the bottom shows when our, our CGT index is extreme or greater than one standard deviation for at least five days within week zero. If we look four weeks into the future after we have this persistent week zero CGT event, we can see that we have this persistent wave or this uh, you know, strong uh, wave train pattern that spans across the Pacific Ocean with an anti-cyclone over kind of the, the central to Eastern United States. Now, if we look at the non-persistent events, where the week zero contains at least one extreme event, but less than five, again, you can see that 
there's really not a persistent wave train across the North Pacific here. And we really don't see that strong anti-cyc anticyclonic circulation occurring um, over the Eastern United States. If we zoom in on the United Eastern United States, um, here I had the, the Z500 and the contours and then the shading here represents soil moisture. So again, looking three to four weeks in the future after this persistent CGT pattern over the, the Pacific Ocean, uh, we can see that we have like extreme soil, significant dry soil moisture anomalies, um, you know, kind of co-located with this anti-cyclone. Anti so of course we, we expect some land atmospheric interaction um, to be playing a role. And if you look over the right, this is just the non-persistent events and you can see how large uh, the differences are. We really don't have any uh, significant uh, soil moisture anomalies and no significant um, anti-cyclone that really develops with the non-persistent CGT events. Uh, next up, I wanna show you why our soil moisture index uh, can be used as a valuable predictor. So again, we're compositing the variables three to four weeks after the soil moisture index is less than the 10th percentile. On the left here shows the soil moisture and shading and the Z500 and contours. So three to four weeks in the future, we see this anti-cyclone that develops over the Eastern half of the United States um, kind of similar we saw with the, the SST index, but we see these dry soil moisture conditions that really persist in, into the week three and four period, even following uh, the extreme soil moisture values. We see a significant increase in atmospheric blocking frequency shown by the contours in the middle plots. And then co-located with our dry soil moisture values, we do see an increase in sensible heat flux as well. And then of course, with this blocking anticyclone, we see a significant increase in extreme warm days per week at weeks three and four, as well as dry SP or the negative SPI shown by the dashed contours, which would indicate dry soil moisture conditions. So now I wanna show you the results of our, our multiple linear regression model using a leave one year out cross validation method. Uh, and these figures here are showing the Spearman rank correlation coefficient between the statistical model and the observations. Uh, on the left, I have those correlations for week three, and then on the right, we have week four. Uh, anything outlined by the, the thick white contour indicates a, a, a statistically significant um, predictions. And you can see that we have large and significant um, prediction skill over the eastern half of the United States, with some values uh, reaching you know, greater than 0.5 um, at weeks three, and then also at weeks four. Um, and you can uh, notice that this is really set up where that we, we were seeing that anti-cyclone associated with the, that, that extreme values in the composite analysis. Now, looking at the SPI prediction skill, it's not as widespread as the extreme warm days as we would expect, but we are still seeing some significant uh, predictions over the east coast of the United States uh, for the week three, four period, and then also the week four, five period when looking at the 14-day SPI. Now, if we compare this to the CFS version two, um, we do have kind of more widespread skill um, with the CFS version two, but we're, when we're looking in the domain that we're really interested in over the Eastern half of the United States, um, you can see where our model, the statistical model really outperforms the CFS version two. Um, and then the CFS version two, you know, lower prediction skill uh, at weeks three and four and four and five for SPI, which is expected um, as it's, you know, this precipitation uh, metric. And then simply doing a, a subtraction to see if the difference in prediction skill. Um, you can see, you know, at week four, the statistical model um, has correlation values that are greater than 0.3 to 0.4 and compared to the uh, CFS version two. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we use a multiple linear regression model, which uses a North Pacific SST index and the second leading principal component of US soil moisture to predict extreme warm days per week and SPI, and it demonstrates greater skill at weeks three and four than the CFS version two. Um, I showed that the extreme values of the North Pacific SST index are associated with a wave train that spans across the Pacific, and it's the persistent wave train patterns that induce the strong SST, and then therefore the extremes um, over the eastern half of the United States. Um, it's also important to note that the increasing blocking occurrence over the eastern US are also attributed to land atmospheric feedback, uh, so we see an increase in blocking frequency. This produces an increase in extreme warm days and low precipitation periods. That would lead to reduced soil moisture, leading to an increase in sensible heat flux and a decrease in latent heat flux, which all help, would help maintain 
a blocking high and aid in these predictions. Uh, again, I thank you all for um, letting me uh, talk during this week three to four webinar. Um, and my email is here, dem2 at illinois.edu, if you have any further questions. Um, thank you so much. Um, thanks, Doug. Um, there were a couple of questions posted in the uh, in the uh, discussion uh, sheet here. Uh, Tom Hamill says, sees there are a number of ways to use the PCA of SSTs. Um, why use your B minus A as a predictor as opposed to just projection onto the principal components pattern as a predictor? Right. Yeah, no, that's that's a, that's a great evaluation. Um, I think when I first um, looked at the um, the SST, um, yeah, you could simply project that and then get the, the, the index values. I think I was looking for a way to kind of keep everything um, separated in a way to have like a, a predictor that's not solely based on um, EOF so that we could easily go to yesterday's you know observations um, in the north pacific and and take a quick index value i didn't explicitly um you know test the projections um, and come up with an index like that uh, i would assume that you know you'd get a, a similar result um, i think i was just looking for kind of the the easiest way to calculate this index okay um, he also asks uh, for using the CFS uh, version 2, um, why use five members? Uh, using lag data, you could form a larger ensemble and filter the noise. Right. No, that's a, that's, that's a great question. Um, um, yeah, there's been a lot of, um, you know, studies that have shown that the lagged, uh, lagged ensemble is going to lead to uh, better prediction skill. Um, I don't really have a good answer why we didn't do that, um, but that is something that um, I could easily put together if this um, paper passes the first round of revisions. I think that's a, a nice suggestion that I can make a change and see um, if the CFS version two produces, you know, more sk uh, skillful results. So that way, it's like um, um, I'm not comparing to, I guess, the worst case scenario, right? With the the four ensemble members, I increase that, and then maybe it's kind of a, a harder benchmark to beat, but um, yeah, that's a great suggestion, and that's something that I'll, I'll keep in account if this uh, paper gets past the first round of revisions. Okay. We have time for maybe one more question. I see uh, Jan is typing one in there right now. Um, and she asks, uh, what soil mo moisture data is used in training the MLR, MLR model, and what's the accuracy of the uh, of that data? Um, so here we use the um, data from the, the ERA interim reanalysis. Um, yeah, it's not the ideal choice. Um, you know, it'd be better to use some, you know, maybe Mara or some other soil moisture. Um, we worked with Trent Ford, who's the, the Illinois state climatologist, and that was one of his main concerns. Um, I was looking um, at several studies that have shown that, um, you know, the ERA interim um, reanalysis soil moisture data is is pretty comparable to those other you know satellite based reanalysis measures. Um, so that's kind of why we uh, I kind of just chose to go with the ER interim data since I already had it. Um, I didn't test the sensitivity to using a different data set, which is something that I, I certainly can do. Um, and I believe the the soil moisture for the ERA interim. Uh, maybe 0.25 so it's it's pretty coarse compared to some satellite measure so yeah as i said it's not the most ideal choice um but that's something that could be a, a definitely easy switch okay thank you um well in the interest of time we are going to go ahead and move on uh to Okay, we're going to get, uh, yep, Jenna's already up there. So um, if anybody else has any more, more questions for uh, Doug, if you want to type them into that document, and maybe he can uh, even answer you inside the document there as well. 
And with that, we'll go ahead and move on and uh, uh, let you take over here. Yes, I would like to share my cam my webcam, but it covers the whole screen. Uh, we, we actually see your uh, slides and a little small picture of you in the webcam. So you're, you're yeah, actually but it covers together. my screen. Oh, it covers your screen. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So I I I, I will try uh, like this. See if it uh, if it works. Okay. How do I? Okay, so uh, be before I uh, begin my presentation, I would like to thank the organizer of the webinar for the opportunity to uh, present our uh, results. And uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Nicholas Leibarker, a former GMU graduate student who is currently a, post a postdoc at uh, NCAR uh, JNT because the presentation I am giving today is based on uh, Nick's PhD uh, work. So the roadmap uh, of my presentation includes a brief description of the theoretical uh, framework that was uh, uh, developed to quantify the MJO and so interaction, a brief uh, summary of the physical mechanism through which the MJO can uh, affect certain uh, um, ENSO events, then an example of how this framework can be applied to uh, ENSO prediction, and I will wrap up uh, my presentation with uh, some uh, conclusions. So um, I hope we are all familiar with the uh, work of uh, Goddard and Philander showing that the most relevant uh, energy quantity to ENSO, the available potential energy or APE, is related to the surface winds through the, uh, this uh, relationship, uh, this equation here, which shows that variations in the available potential energy result from the interannual uh, fluctuations of work done by the surface uh, winds. The term uh, I want you to pay attention is this W, the work uh, done by the surface uh, winds on the ocean. Uh, also known as the wind power and is defined as the dot product between the wind stress and the ocean surface current. In this formulation, uh, all of these quantity represent monthly uh, means and uh, monthly anomalies. So to introduce the MJO influence, uh, we will decompose the, mon uh, the monthly uh, wind stress anomalies into an MJO component and some um, residual. And for the ocean, we will decompose the currents into a Kelvin wave component and also some um, residual. To isolate the uh, MJO component of the wind stress, we use uh, a method introduced by uh, Chidong Zhang and John Gottschalk in 2002. But uh, this is something that uh, we will be working as part of our uh, CTP uh, project because this method requires bandpass filtering of data and when applied to seasonal forecast, intra-seasonal uh, filtering becomes um, a limitation. So uh, using this definition, the wind power can be uh, related to the MJO variability and also to some uh, frequency variability in uh, the ocean and uh, in the atmosphere. So the most important uh, term um, is this one highlighted uh, here in uh, in red, and we will uh, call it the WMJOK, and uh, represents the wind power associated with the MJO wind stress and uh, oceanic Kelvin waves. Um, these two plots show the composites of the standard deviation of the WMJOK for uh, El Nino events in observations for a very short period of time, 1988-2016, and uh, a climate uh, simulation with a superparameterized uh, CCSM. Uh, we choose to look both at observations and the model simulation because uh, in the climate uh, simulation, the number of events is larger than that available uh, in the OBS. So uh, we select SPCCSM because this model has a very good simulation of the MJO and a decent simulation of uh, ENSO. So what we notice here in these two plots is that El Nino events are associated with uh, a small region of increased variability of WMJK 
uh, WMJOK, which will refer to as the WMJOK region. Uh, this region will also be used to construct an index, which uh, we don't have a better name for it, so we'll just call it WMJOK uh, index. So uh, when this uh, index is plotted against the uh, Nino 3 index, we see a clear uh, linear relationship between the two uh, metrics. Um, in SPCCSM, the regression coefficient uh, is significant at the 95% uh, level, whereas in observations, the significance is lower, uh, presumably due to a smaller sample size. So uh, based on this, uh, values of the MJO, uh, WMJOK, we separated the El Nino events into events strongly influenced by MJO, and those events are characterized by a, a large value of the uh, index, and uh, El Nino events that are weakly or not influenced by MJO, and uh, those uh, events are the ones for which the uh, WMJOK index has uh, small uh, values. So um, we uh, based uh, our uh, analysis on observations and, and mostly uh, this one was like uh, the, the whole points where the years were divided into 30-30% uh, uh, and that's how we uh, uh, categorize our, uh, our events. So Next, let's see uh, if this uh, criterion help us distinguish other characteristic of uh, El Nino events if they actually are uh, are uh, independent uh, events. And in this slide, we are comparing the composites of the SST anomalies uh, for the uh, strong uh, uh, events, which means the uh, ENSO events uh, influenced by uh, by uh, uh, MJO activity and weak events, which means um, ENSO events that uh, are weakly uh, influenced or not influenced by uh, by the MJO activity. So a few things to uh, to notice here is the strong cases show more intense anomaly growth in the Eastern uh, Pacific, and the strong eastward propagation of the anomalies from the Western Pacific. For weak cases, the SST uh, growth is largely confined to uh, the Central uh, Pacific. Um, another uh, thing we choose to look at is the um, Kelvin wave activity associated with the two categories, and uh, we see that in the case in the strong cases, uh, there is a substantial uh, downwelling Kelvin wave occurrence in the Western Pacific, whereas for weak cases, we only notice a, a sporadic and weak occurrence. Uh, of Kelvin waves. Also for uh, weak cases, the down, uh, downwelling Kelvin wave activity are lar is largely confined to the Central uh, Eastern Pacific, consistent with the pattern of the SST anomalies that uh, we saw in, in the previous uh, slide. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, I have to uh, move on um, with these comparisons, but if you are interested, uh, you can find more uh, in our 2018 uh, paper. So uh, now that uh, we have an understanding of what happens in the ocean on the MJO has an influence on um, El Nino events, and also we have a way, more important, we have a way of quantifying this interaction. The question we have is, can we describe the physical mechanisms driving this interaction? And to answer this question, we use the simple ocean model that can be easily modified to conduct sensitivity experiments. And um, we use the ZBRK model, um, the ocean component of uh, the ZBRK model that was forced with uh, SPCCSM uh, wind stress. And uh, I hope that the uh, figures that I show you before based on SPCCSM uh, explain why uh, we choose the SPCCSM um, for um, for this purpose. So we conducted two uh, sensitivity experiments by altering the phasing between the MJO wind stress and Kelvin wave activity via reversal of Kelvin wave phase. So in one experiment, uh, the downwelling Kelvin waves are reversed when simultaneous with westerly wind stress in the WMJO uh, K region. So uh, what we do in this experiment, we um, 
alter the phasing between the MJO wind stress and Kelvin waves noticed during the, the strong uh, cases. In the second uh, experiment, the upwelling Kelvin waves are reversed when simultaneous with westerly wind stress in the WMJOK region. So in this ex experiment, a phasing is established between the MJO wind stress and uh, Kelvin waves. So in other words, the weak cases are forced to become um, strong cases. So uh, we can look at many outcomes of these experiments, but here I, I choose Nino 3 as a metric for uh, comparison. And what I'm showing in this plot is the Nino 3 difference between the experiment that I just described and some control uh, runs um, that uh, were conducted without uh, change, any changes uh, of, in the model. So this is a busy plot because we conducted other sensitivity experiments and they are all summarized here. But what I want you to focus here is the blue bars and the green bars. The blue bars show that strong cases experience a large decrease in the Nino 3 uh, index when the MJO wind stress is not in phase with the downwelling Kelvin waves. And the green bars show that weak cases uh, experience an increase in the Nino 3 index when the westerly MJO wind stress is in phase with down, uh, downwelling uh, Kelvin waves. So these results present a compelling evidence that uh, MJO can, be, can efficiently exchange energy with the ocean when uh, westerly winds entering in the WMJOK region coincide with uh, downwelling uh, Kelvin waves. So this argument uh, can be better illustrated uh, in a lag correlation plot, uh, like the one showed here in, in this slide. And in this diagram, we plotted the uh, correlation between the wind stress average over the WMJOK region and the Kelvin wave component of the thermocline depth anomaly average between five south and uh, five north. To orient us a little bit, the white bar at lag zero indicates the WMJOK um, region. So at negative lags, uh, Kelvin waves lead and at positive uh, lags, MJO winds lead. So, uh, uh, and another thing is that a positive correlation uh, means that downwelling Kelvin waves are correlated with the westerly uh, MJO uh, wind stress. So uh, for El Nino events uh, strongly influenced by uh, MJO shown uh, in the panel on the left, westerly wind stress anomalies over the WMJOK region are preceded by upwelling Kelvin waves in the Western Pacific and followed by downwelling Kelvin waves that propagate in, in the Eastern Pacific. So the upwelling swells the thermocline in the Western Pacific, whereas the downwelling deepens um, the thermocline and increases the SSD uh, in the Eastern uh, Pacific. So another thing to notice here uh, in this plot is the significant negative correlation at negative lags, suggesting that the Kelvin waves are not necessarily excited by um, the MJO wind forcing. Um, so this is a, a result that uh, some studies claim that the actually the MJO can actually excite the, the uh, Kelvin wave uh, um, in, in the ocean. So now when we look at the El Nino cases not influenced by the MJO shown on the panel, um, in the panel on the right, the opposite is fine to what uh, we saw for the uh, strong cases and the Kelvin wave activity following the MJO is only insignificantly related to the MJO uh, activity. So uh, for the reminder of this presentation, I will focus on applying this new framework to uh, ENSO uh, prediction. And uh, the WMJO K index was useful in helping us understanding the interaction between the MJO and ENSO. However, this index has very little value in uh, distinguishing between El Nino and uh, other years and probably the cause is the lack of information uh, about the uh, SSD. And um, to add this uh, SSD variability, we uh, designed a uh, bivariate UF analysis in which the 
um, SSD anomalies average between 5 south and 5 north are combined with the WMJOK uh, average over the same uh, area. And of course, as required by uh, this analysis, both variables um, were standardized to um, uh, um, be dimensionless, dimensionless. And uh, the uh, domain of the EOF analysis is the uh, Equatorial uh, Pacific. So uh, in this slide, we are looking at the uh, daily time uh, series of the uh, PC1 and PC2 that resulted from uh, the uh, multivariate uh, EOF analysis. And uh, in uh, black, uh, we show the uh, monthly mean time series of NINO 3.4 uh, index. The EOF1 uh, explains about 31% uh, of the daily variability, and uh, EOF2 explains about 21% of uh, the daily variability. The vertical bars, bars mark the uh, El Nino years, and uh, during this uh, period that uh, we analyzed, and the red bars denote the El Nino events identified as being influenced by uh, the MJO using the uh, WMJOK uh, index. So the first thing to notice here is the good agreement between the PC1 and NINO 3.4 uh, index. And um, uh, we see that PC2 is dominated by the intraseasonal variability of the uh, WMJOK index. Um, a close inspection of uh, the events marked by uh, the red bar um, also reveal a, a slightly higher amplitude of PC2 compared to uh, the other uh, years. So uh, we use these two uh, time series to create uh, new indices that uh, we will show they can be used as uh, ENSO predictors. The first index, make, uh, describes the, which describes the uh, covariability of uh, MJO, Kelvin wave, and ENSO, that's where uh, its name comes from, make, is defined as the minimum value of uh, PC1 plus the absolute value of uh, PC2 over a 90-day uh, period. So uh, what this means, so for example, the value of make for uh, April is the minimum value of PC1 plus the absolute value of PC2 on any day between April uh, and, and June. Uh, so uh, one thing to notice about this index, the uh, make index is that uh, it has a monthly cadence where are the PC1 and PC2 have a, a, a daily uh, uh, cadence. So um, when this uh, index is greater than minus uh, 0.5 standard deviation in April, um, an El Nino event is more likely to uh, develop. So um, make, uh, by definition, is intended to capture the El Nino events which are associated with positive values of PC1. Remember, PC1 is uh, Nino 3.4 and the negative values of the wind power, which are required by, uh, which are associated with also with the uh, uh, El Nino event. So for this reason, we choose the absolute value of PC2 so that um, the positive uh, SSD and the negative uh, wind power have a constructive uh, interference. The second index, Maki, uh, describe the MJO and Kelvin wave influence, that's where its name comes from, is defined as the um, sum between uh, the minimum value of the sum of PC1 plus PC2 uh, over a 90 day uh, period. Uh, this index is intended to uh, be applied only to the years that have been uh, identified by MAKE uh, as the El Nino years. And uh, we notice that when Maki drops below minus uh, to standard deviation uh, in April, the MJO influence on uh, El Nino events is, uh, is more likely to occur. Uh, similar to make, Maki is on, it's also only defined at a monthly uh, cadence. So 
when we um, describe these two indices, we, we can say that MAKE is designed to capture El Nino events for which the MJO ENSO covariability is dominated by the wind power. And MAKI is uh, designed to further ide uh, identify the events for which this influence is, is, uh, is maximum. So again, um, if you are interested in uh, more details about the physical explanation of these uh, indices, I invite you to uh, look at our paper that was published uh, last year. So uh, in this figure, I am showing the time series of the two indices that uh, I just described. Uh, make is shown in red and Maki is, is shown in blue. Again, the red, uh, uh, the bars uh, show the uh, El Nino uh, years and the red and blue horizontal lines, I hope you, you can see them, corresponds to the thresholds that can be used for uh, prediction purposes. Um, also, uh, every uh, El Nino year has a, a vertical uh, thin uh, line uh, which is, which corresponds to uh, April 1st, which is the, the month with the uh, as have identified as having uh, predictive power for for these uh, indices. So when you look at these indices and and the threshold, uh, you can see that overall uh, make values are much greater than uh, minus zero point five sigma, and actually uh, almost everywhere uh, positive. But there is this event in two thousand nine which uh, will not be captured if the threshold will be uh, much larger. And of course, this comes, this choice of the threshold comes with the price, which we will see uh, in the next slide. So for uh, all El Nino years influenced by the uh, MJO activity, uh, Mackie has a value smaller than minus um, two uh, standard deviations. And uh, again, a close inspection of all the years identified by um, the WMJO key, uh, K index as having El Nino events influenced by, uh, M by MJO have a value of make that's greater than minus uh, 0.5 uh, standard deviation and a value of uh, Mackey that's smaller than uh, minus two sigma in, in April. So um, before I uh, we look into the potential predictability of these ind uh, indices, I want us to revisit the phasing between the MJO wind stress and oceanic Kelvin waves that I mentioned as a physical mechanism uh, driving the MJO uh, and so uh, interaction. So in this slide, we are looking the lag correlation between the wind stress, um, the same lag correlation that I showed earlier, but in this case, we are looking at observations. Um, Unfortunately, for the observations, we have a very small uh, sample size. We have only three years uh, in which El Nino events are influenced by uh, um, by MJO uh, activity. But uh, even though the plots are noisier, we see again some of the features that I mentioned when uh, we look at the modeling uh, results. So on the left, we have the uh, El Nino events identified by Mackey as being influenced the uh, MJO. And on the right, we have the El Nino events that do not meet the uh, Mackey uh, threshold. So for the um, El Nino events not influenced by uh, uh, MJO activity, we can see that the westerly winds are followed by upwelling Kelvin waves in the Eastern Pacific, which means that the MJO is out of phase with the oceanic uh, Kelvin waves, the requirement uh, for the interaction between the two um, uh, phenomena. So uh, for the El Nino events influenced by the MJO, we see the positive correlation between the westerly uh, winds and downwelling uh, Kelvin waves in, in the Eastern uh, Pacific. So again, uh, the mechanism that uh, we propose based on uh, models uh, hold in observations. So to check if these indices um, are useful for the ENSO prediction, we use two metrics, the contingency tables and the associated high key skill score. The first table on the left shows the skill of make for two uh, months, April and May. And May. And uh, for comparison, we apply the same uh, metrics to Nino 3.4, which are showed um, 
in the table uh, on the right. So uh, make forecast all El Nino events, uh, whereas Nino 3.4 has only six hits and misses three uh, events. However, make has a higher false alarm uh, than uh, the false alarm of uh, Nino 3.4. Uh, but overall, make has a higher, um, a slightly higher uh, high key skill score than uh, Nino 3.4 when used as a predictor uh, in April. Uh, Maki, uh, which is shown uh, in the table, in the bottom table, also predicts uh, all El Nino events affected by uh, MJO, but also the false alarm is, is high. So, um, when the same metric is applied to the May, June, July season, if you remember the definition of, of these indices, the score uh, wanes slightly uh, while using the mean of Nino 3.4 does not change um, the result. So what happens when uh, we uh, use these uh, indices, uh, we apply them to a real uh, model, and here we are uh, evaluate we evaluated the forecast skill of uh, CF, uh, CFSV2 in, into um, a short uh, um, reforecast ensemble of uh, reforecast with the reforecast period 1984-2014. Um, uh, we have uh, five ensemble members uh, initialized on April 1st and run for, uh, for three months. So um, using uh, MAKE, the model misses only two events, whereas Nino 3.4 misses six events. So uh, high key skill score based on Nino 3.4 is barely outperforming the chance and is greatly surpassed by the score based on, uh, on make. Um, we don't have results uh, using Maki because CFS does not uh, forecast any uh, ENSO event as being influenced by, uh, by, uh, by the MJO. We also computed the rock curves based on the Nino 3.4 uh, and uh, make. And again, we show that make uh, has a better uh, probabilistic uh, score. So in conclusion, we established a quantitative framework for evaluating the influence of MJO on El Nino events. And we have the WMJOK index that captures the uh, covariability uh, with Kelvin uh, between the MJO wind stress and oceanic Kelvin waves. Using this framework, we show that a necessary condition for MJO and so interaction is the coherent phasing between the westerly MJO wind stress and downwelling uh, Kelvin waves. And we propose two predictors for, uh, with potential for uh, improving ENSO prediction and evaluate the representation of RC uh, interaction in, in the models. So we have the MJO Kelvin wave ENSO or uh, make index that slightly outperforms the Nino 3.4 index as a, as a predictor. And the MJO Kelvin wave influence or Maki index that shows promising results for predicting the impact of uh, MJO on ENSO evolution. And this was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see, I see uh, Jan is typing a question into the uh, document here. We'll wait for that. If anybody else has any questions, um, you can either type them into the document or um, into the chat box. And Jan asks, um, in the index, describe the deficiency in the coupled model. Absolutely. Yes. They are designed to uh, see if the model actually captured the uh, RC interaction between the uh, high frequency of the winds and the uh, Kelvin wave activity uh, in, in the ocean. But the model needs to, to provide the daily output of the ocean uh, currents, the surface, surface ocean currents. So uh, the reason that we use the very small uh, 
ensemble reforecast of CFS was that this uh, ensemble, these reforecasts were created as part of a, a project at COLA. Um, so, um, in order to evaluate the model, we need high frequency output uh, for the ocean. Okay. Christina, uh, sorry, I, I just uh, asked. Yeah, go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Um, have you looked at this uh, in the CCSM, the other couple model? How, how well do they describe the interaction between the wind stress and the oceanic carbon waves in CCSM? Four? Oh, the the yes. So uh, yeah, obviously. So. We do have the whole analysis in our first paper that was published in 2018. So um, it it reproduces very well the uh, the wind the relation the the wind power. It it, it looks very uh, very good. Yeah. So in the so um, for this relationship to be captured by uh, by uh, the forecast, by the model, there are two requirements. One, you need to have a good simulation of the MJO because if the MJO is not there with the right frequency and the, the in the right uh, spot, uh, I, I showed you that there is a particular region uh, where this interaction needs to happen. Uh, obviously, there is it will be hard for for the model to um, actually reproduce the uh, MJO uh, and so interaction and even in this CFS that we have in in the last paper we have we we do look at some of the uh, um, a little bit of the half molar diagram of of the MJO and um, there are some some problems with the distribution of, of the wind stress uh, associated with uh, with the MJO in CFS. So that's one thing. And then another, uh, the, the second part of being able to reproduce, uh, to have a successful uh, interaction is that the, the actual uh, energy uh, exchange between the atmosphere and, and the ocean need, needs to take, uh, take place. So, um, so in in this model, um, we think that the uh, the ENSO that is produced is mostly driven by uh, by the um, the ocean, the ocean dynamics and thermodynamics, and the atmosphere is probably not so much in sync with with the ocean. Okay, there are several questions in the uh, questions box here. Um, and I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, we may have time for like one here or so. Um, okay. There is a question here on can the approach be used to predict La Nina? We haven't looked into uh, La Nina at all. Uh, probably another <laughs> PhD student uh, can uh, can can look into that. Uh, so there are some hints. So uh, for example, when looking at, um, at this, uh, at the time series of, of these uh, indices. Uh, so um, for La Nina, the, uh, the value of PC2 is also large. So that's the reason if you look at the, the La Nina years, pick your favorite La Nina years from, from this time series, you will see that uh, PC2 um, is also um, has a large value. So there is potential for this um, for this uh, framework to, to be extended, but the, the, probably there is a lot of work need, needs to be done similarly with what we have done for uh, for El Nino. Okay. Um, 
There is a, another question in the document here. Uh, MJO has strong diversity in terms of amplitude prop in propagation. I'm wondering what kind of conditions favor the strong influence of MJO on ENSO. So we actually tested um, some, not I mean not all of them, but for example, we did we uh, we did some sensitivity test where we like uh, we did with uh, changing the phase of Kelvin waves. We did uh, and they are actually here shown some of them. So for example, this one that says the uh, orange one MJO two uh, two X, we increase the amplitude of uh, of the MJO. Um, winds to see if that has an impact and we we didn't get a, a convincing result that the amplitude of the MJO um, is uh, is the main uh, main driver so uh, what matters is this timing between the uh, occurrence of westerly winds uh, and the uh, downwelling Kelvin waves being in, in the same location. Okay, thank you. We're right at the top of the hour right now. I know there's a couple more questions in the questions box. Um, and if you'd like an answer to those, um, if you could actually go into the discussion document that's in the chat box below. Um, if you don't have access, go ahead and request access. Let me access. click and see if I have access. Yeah, I need, I will request access. Okay, we will give that to you. If anybody else wants to request access, um, please do. And um, and if you want to just post your questions in there, that would be great. And uh, Christiana will uh, be able to answer that, and we will make sure uh, Doug. If there's any more questions for him, um, he can check back in on that uh, as well. Um, but uh, at the top of the hour here. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, both speakers uh, for taking the time to for the presentations and um, thank uh, everyone else for uh, coming and uh, listening. And I don't know, Karen or Jan, do you have anything else to add? Um, Mark, uh, are, yeah. those, uh, are those slides going to be available for folks um, to look at? I will request the slides uh, from Christiana and uh, uh, Doug, and uh, we will uh, uh, get those uh, be, and have those be made available to anybody. Um, Karen, do you want to talk about the the web page you are going uh, we, we are going to build for this webinar? Briefly. Oh, sure. We're putting together a um, NOAA VLAB page where we will store all past um, webinars so people can go on there and take a look um, at old ones. And also there'll be a forum to just, um, discuss any questions on it. And we're putting that together and hopefully we'll have it ready for next month. We'll show a little preview of it then. Okay, great. Uh, thanks to everyone once again uh, for listening and for presenting. And we will hopefully see you uh, uh, next month, beginning of the month, first uh, Monday uh, again and uh, same time. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.